They came in the middle of the night. I was asleep. I think about 4 a.m. in the morning. Very loud banging. I wasn't uh, prepared at all, I put it uh, mildly. Lots of lights flashing. Uh. A very terrifying experience. And showed some kind of a badge very fast and said he was from, uh, I think, Juchet Police Station. They showed me an identity. They said that they are looking for uh, illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants. So my immediate thought was that, bloody hell, who sabo me? And my sister came, rushing to my small room, uh, uh, and then uh, said, quick, 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 keep your things away. And the moment they came in, they said, you're under arrest. They were from ISD and they were uh, under, arrested under ISA. They searched my house, we were not allowed to move. I was immediately handcuffed there. Peter also asked them a question, uh, doesn't she have any rights? This, uh, yeah. And um, he looked at Peter and uh, didn't answer Peter. And after searching the house? Guards who stood next to Peter and I all the time. And then uh, they went through all my things. They ransacked the whole place for about two hours or so. Searched every room? Nobody could come in, come into the room. What worries me was not so much what they took out from my house because there was nothing precious. What worries me was what they put into my house. So they took two sacks full of, of uh, my, my stuff. And they didn't bother to show me what they took from my house. And they were quite happy, uh, uh, quite happy like, because uh, I think uh, because they found my diaries. So anyway, I was bundled off in a the, in the car. But it wasn't just me. They also took Jenny. So I was actually quite surprised. They actually... Um, that actually worried me a great deal, concerned me a great deal. My mom was outside, uh, so when I was led away, she was crying. So I just wanted to give her a hug. I said, no, no, go. So anyway, we were bundled in two separate cars and taken to some unknown place. So it was during the journey that I was blindfolded. You know. And then they took me to this place and, you know, they, 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 they were stripped and then we had to change the prison guard, took photographs and all that. Wore the prison uh, 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 tunic, a fingerprinted photograph. After that, straight to the dungeon. You know. And then marched off through narrow corridors, darkened corridors, down steps into this underground kind of place. Straight away, I, I, I could see that uh, the aura was there, you know, that uh, completely dark. And barefooted, it was cold. With all these green lights and uh, red lights and so on. You know? So uh, at that time, yeah, of course, uh, you, you, you wouldn't know what uh, they were. And after a lot of walking, uh, they, they opened the door and into a room. I think if I'm not wrong, it's C22. And it's... It's very cold in there, with, the, with, with a strong air conditioning vent right on top of me. And, and the walls are padded with uh, linings and all that. So you know that whatever you say down there, or he's, you know, he, he can shout to you, or, you know, he's not going to get out. So, uh, uh, dark, very dark. It's only the spotlight uh, shining at you. And uh, you could see the, 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 uh, the, the officers there, your interrogators, but <clears throat> you couldn't really see their faces very clearly. Yeah. At first, they, they took off my glasses, but I could see uh, shadows and, and people wearing very uh, a winter, you know, just like if you go skiing in the, in the country, that kind of clothing, yeah. And kind of big, big table. I couldn't make out how many people were there. And, and then they started interrogating. The Internal Security Department has uncovered a Marxist conspiracy to subvert the existing social and political system in Singapore through Communist United Front tactics to establish a communist state. 16 persons involved in this conspiracy were arrested on the 21st of May, 1987, under the Internal Security Act. They are Vincent Cheng Kim Chuan, Tae Hong Seng, William Yap Hong Yan, Chia Bun Tai, Kenneth Sang Chi Seng, Jenny Chin Lai Ching, Theresa Lim Lee Kok, Wong Suk Yi, Teo So Lung, Tan Thi Seng, Lao Yit Leng, Chung Lai Mei, Ng Bi Leng, Ma Li Lin, Tang Le Li, and Kevin Desmond D'Souza.
So when they came, I thought, oh, oh dear, here we go. And it's 2 a.m. in the morning, the, 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 the dogs were barking, because I, you know, and, uh, uh, and I live in a very old pre-war house. It's very thick walls, uh, iron bars or windows, a bolt across my, my, my very thick door. They, they couldn't have got in if I didn't want to let them in. Uh. They could have, they would use crowbars and they would destroy my door, but it would have taken some time. So when they came, I, I, I thought to myself, oh dear, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be in, you know, a, a state for a long time. I better take a shower. <laughs> so, uh, so I told my wife, don't open the door until I've taken a shower. So they were banging on the door, you know, sort of thing, and making a lot of the dogs were barking. Then my neighbor, you know, shouted, shouted we are going to call the police. <laughs> 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 and I could hear them sniggering outside, you know, <laughs> my door. But anyway, so 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 I, I went. I took a shower, and then then you know the, the door was open. And then um, I decided that because I saw the the pictures of the the first batch of people mm. arrested, and they all looked deranged. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <That's me. laughs> some were better than others. Right, right. Some were but they were looking not very good. So I thought, hmm, I wonder when those pictures were taken, you know, months at the time of the arrest. So I decided I better put on a suit and a tie. <laughs> so, so, I, so I did. And then, of course, then they searched my place. They, they searched, all, uh, they went through all my things. Then they didn't uh, object to the fact that I was wearing a suit and a tie, you know, right? <laughs> it was Simbo Heng who objected to it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so then after that, then they took, they, they, they took me to my office and then they searched my office again. So by the time we were done with my first my place and my office, it was, I think, daylight already. Mm. So I got into the car, they put on uh, the blindfolds. The blindfold is a, a, a pair of glasses with sponges st stuck to the, the inside so that it covers up your eye. And, and then, uh, and then the, rubber band around <laughs> the, the arms, very crude blindfolds. And then I, once I, the car door was open, you know, immediately two Gurkhas grabbed my arm and my shoulder and my armpit and it's all like frog marching me. So I was being led, you know, down and down what seemed like very long corridors, down one corridor, down another corridor, down the third corridor. Then I was, I came to a room. So all this time I was blindfolded. And I was pushed to sit down on a chair. And at that point, they took out my blindfold. And right in front of me was a camera. Oh, wow. And they took the picture. So at that point, the blindfold, blindfold was taken off. I smiled. <laughs> <laughs> and they took my picture. And that was the picture that came out the next day in the Straits Times. It looked like my wedding picture. <laughs> right. So, um, so Sim Poheng was very upset with me for that. <laughs> for that, he, he he slapped me about fifty times. <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah, he said, "You think you're very smart, huh? You're very quiet, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> so then, of course, I was I was I was led inside the interrogation room, which has a basement of the complex there. So uh, the way they interrogate is during your first three days, your first 70, 72 hours is round the clock into uh, round the clock interrogation. So the, the ISD has got two shifts, the 12 hour shifts, right? And of course they're all very warmly dressed. And the, 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 the way the two shifts work is, is a good cop and bad cop. One shift is a good cop, the other shift is a bad cop. So the bad cop will abuse you and the good cop will commiserate with you, right? And, um, and, and speak bad about the bad cops. Uh, very, you know, terrible, terrible people, yeah. So, uh, and so I was standing there, and this this Indian uh, ISD officer, you know, there's a pile of the files on the table. I said, your file. And he said, are you a Marxist? That's the first question they asked me. Are you a Marxist? I said no. And before I knew, it, he whacked me across the face. Then he asked me again. Are you a Marxist? I said, no. He whacked me across the face again. I said, this is not working out very well. <laughs> then he asked me, 
are you a Marxist? Again, I said no, and he whacked me across this and he took a file and he opened it and there's a bookmark and there's a yellow underline, highlight, and it says, even your friends call you a Marxist. And then he slapped me again. So I said, oh shit, they intercepted a letter which uh, an American friend of mine in my course on Marx had written to me. This was from, you know, five, six years ago when I was in university. And I'm a, I'm a social studies student, so of course I read Marx, mm. right? Mm. And this friend was trying to, this, this, at that time I just started my business, I was telling her how it's going. And so this friend was trying to make, crack a joke and said, for, for Marxist, Casey, you sound like a very good businessman. Right. So they had intercepted that letter. And, and, and there it is saying, you know, calling, calling me a Marxist. But this, this first Indian guy was, who, who hit me uh, several times, uh, that was not the, the, the main person who hit me a lot was Sim, Sim Po Hing. Uh, and, and the way he would hit me is that he would back up to the end of the room then he would start running towards me, <laughs> and then he jumps up in front of me, and he whacks me across the face. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of strength. Yeah. yeah, because he's a yeah. small guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. A, I'm a small guy too. <laughs> so it would just knock the wind out of me, right? Oh. Then when he did that, I said, "Please do not hit me," and immediately he hit me again. I said, please don't hit me. And immediately he hit me again. I said, I better stop saying this. <laughs> it's, it's kind of not working. <laughs> but, but, um, but he did this running thing several times, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So this is his thing. Yeah, I, I, it like a like slam dunk, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so then, um, um, and I didn't know at the time, but the, the hits were so hard that uh, uh, I, I actually was bleeding inside my mouth because my, my, my teeth were cut my cheeks, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and, and, and it was not just my face, but also my, 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 my chest and my back. The, 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 I, also the back hits is, I mean, your back is tougher than your front, but, but it was only after about 22 hours, the reason why I, I, I realized that is because I finally realized, hey, damn, I haven't gone to the bathroom for a very long time. Mm. My, my bladder is quite full. <laughs> so I said, can I go to the bathroom, please? So they escorted me out. And the first time they escorted me out, I almost collapsed because I've been staying on the spot for 22 hours. Mm. And my knees, as I took a step forward, kind of almost gave way, you know. Mm. Um, I went to the bathroom and my, I looked at the mirror and my hair was all oily and matted and I washed my mouth and that was when, when I washed my mouth and, and, and sort of spit out the water. That's when I saw, eh, jeez, what is this? A lot of blood, <laughs> you know? But I knew a little factoid which a, a friend of mine who was an emergency medical technician had told me. And he said, of all the places in your body, the easiest place to heal is the inside of your mouth. The, your inside cheeks. So for some reason, I remembered that. I said, oh, good, my, my cuts will heal soon. I was standing up. He came up to me and uh, he gave me about 10 slaps actually across the face, 10 hard slaps across the face. It shocked me at that time uh, to realize that, oh, they are now using violence, you know. They are really uh, using uh, assault to break you down. But I was telling myself that I had to still remain firm and, and not to give in, and not to give in. And that whole 
confrontational uh, uh, attitude, you know, continue till uh, after dinner time when the director of operations you know, came into the room and asked SK whether I had confessed. You know, of course, SK said, I still uh, refuse to confess. So, this director came up to me, I was standing up, and using the forearm of his hand, you know, he slammed me on the back. And so I fell forward and uh, stood up again. And with his forearm again, he slammed me on the chest. So I kind of uh, fell backwards. At the same time, he was... Uh, um, barking, you know, angry words at me, you know, say you are a Marxist a communist, and then he walked off. Every hour he would come back again, and he would do the same thing, slamming me actually on the back, on the front, and then walk off. He must have done this, I think, till about midnight, I think, or slightly after midnight. When he came in front of me, gave me the same slamming on the back and the chest, and then I confronted him. I told him, I said, you can continue beating me, I'm willing to suffer. He became very angry. He gave me another slam on the back and the chest, and then he came in front of me angrily, you know. I didn't know what he was trying to do, you know. And he gave me one hard punch on the abdomen. Wow, that was really painful. You know, you know I went down on the floor and he was telling me, you confess, say you're a Marxist. You know. So I was so fearful, I was worried that there might be internal bleeding and so I looked up and said, okay, okay, la, Marxist. So at that very moment, the lights came on. And they brought a glass of hot tea and a plate of angku kueh. So that was you know, the, the victory, you know, that they have really uh, got me into submission. So till today, uh, when I look at Angku Kwe, I have a real dislike especially for, the, for this uh, Nonia delicacy. <laughs> and I think after about maybe half an hour, the lights went off again, and now interrogation proper. SK would open its file, no? and then uh, he would say that uh, we will now have to interrogate you about your all your activities from then till even the days of my seminary that they wanted to know. No? And it was from there that I realized that every three years, I seem to have changed my job. Hmm? So uh, the last job I had was three years actually in the Justice and Peace Commission. Before that, it was three years actually in Geelong Catholic Center. And before that, it was uh, even three years uh, working actually in the legal firm and then it went on backwards. Mm -hmm. But 
the immediate um, interrogation was about what I was doing at the time. For example, they would say you uh, you you organize a, a seminar, you know, about the poor in Singapore. Okay, I would agree that I, I did that, and they were asked, you know, how did I go about organizing it? Who helped me? And why were you doing all this? You know. So I would say, oh. It was because of the social teaching of the church that I wanted to promote. No, 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 no. You know, you were actually trying to promote Marxism. So I would deny. No, I never did that. It was not my intention actually to organize that seminar on the poor because I wanted to promote communism or Marxism. Hey, you have just confessed huh, that you are a Marxist. Huh? So I realized that what they want you to do now uh, is to self-incriminate. You, know? you have to incriminate yourself that uh, just because they have broken you down, you know, you have now to incriminate yourself in all the activities that you have done. They will say, right, give you a piece of A4 paper, pen, and they say, right, well, wondering actually, what am I going to write? He said, write what we have just actually talked about. I still couldn't actually put down the words. No? So he would dictate to me. You know, like I joined or I organized this uh, seminar about poverty in Singapore because I want to use it to promote Marxism. Well, I, I would write it down in that same way. And you will complete actually one page, he told me, sign at the bottom of the page. So I had to sign at the bottom of the page. And then it will go on pages after pages. And um, the started talking about whether I was a Marxist and you know, you know how much have I read and all that, all of that. And at various times this guy Simpo Hing and there were others as well, they punched and slapped me. It was very clear that these things were done with the aim to make me feel powerless as well as to bring about certain compliances. It's like, hey, you're not saying the right things, you know, for us to hear. Um, we, 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 you know, when you are happen to be at the receiving end of all this, uh, you feel very vulnerable. You feel very vulnerable for several reasons, because you know that you're going to be there, completely powerless. Huh? You're going to be there for as long a time as they determine. There's really no way that you can um, uh, 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 have any sense of time. And once you're in that room, uh, whether it's daylight or night, uh, you have no sense of You're just completely disoriented. And then they start saying things like, uh, look, you know, we're going to beat up your wife in front of you. Because, I, you know, Jenny was there. And that, that really just, 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 just blew my mind. I, I was just went, 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 I mean, it just go very, very, you know, soft after that. But one of the things of this whole um, was, when I start going to the toilet. So they take me out to the toilet. But at the toilet, I can hear clear, audible sounds, you know of groaning, you know, somebody groaning. So it's almost as though the toilet was next to a cell and someone was groaning under pain. And it was very, very real. But of course, after, you know, after the first 72, after the first <coughs> couple of weeks, you know, you, you know, you can, you know, same toilet, you know, you go out there and say, hey, you know, this, this cannot be right, you know. But anyway, um, 
because there cannot be any exposed cells, you see, you know, and there's nobody sort of like. But but it sounded really real, so they must have planted some of these devices to create the sounds. Now, this was most terrifying for me because the thing is that I knew that some of you were in, because they said so. But the sounds of the person was a woman. And that made me really worried because mm. it could have been Jenny, you see. Mm. So that really, really tore me up, you know. So as far as the compliance was concerned, I was really quite ready to comply, you know. My case officer, of course, first question was, do you know why you're here? Uh, laugh, la, ah. So I said, you made a mistake. <laughs> then I immediately got two hints that I, uh, two things that they told me. First, we don't make mistakes here. Two, we can squeeze blood out of stone. I said, oh, that is, a, that is a, a important precursor to the interview that's going to come out. So I said, okay, registered. They don't make mistake. They can squeeze blood out of stone. Then, of course, it's there again, but they didn't tell me why, I'm, why, why I was arrested for. So, but they keep wanting to say, you know why you are here. Mm-hmm. Right? You know why you... So the, the, the question was just wanting me to say, say why I'm there, or, or, or hoping that I say something that, that sort of fit into the, the kind of picture. So, but it was just so ding-dong you know, for, for hours and hours and so on. So occasionally, my case officer would do this kind of action. They say, pull out his sock, show me his revolver. In the <laughs> so, I, of course, I, I know these are not just plain thing. It was really to intim, intimidate me, that kind of thing, and so on. But it was at that point of time, I did think that it's possible to use that, that stupid thing of me. So, but that was how how it went on and on and on and on. Doing the first serve, I don't know how many hours. It's just plain shouting that you know what you're in here for. Don't pretend you don't know what you have done to to be here and all that. So it's just just very random kind of things. Mm. And for me, I said that, I said that firstly, uh, okay, of course they, they knew that, oh, I have, we found all these type of books in your house, no? Uh, all these uh, thin yellow books on uh, Marxism and all that. I said, if you have found it in my house, you will know that it's still very pristine because we <laughs> hardly touch it. You know? <laughs> Nobody touch it, actually. And then suddenly this bloody case officer, the second round one, said that, aha, I found the book on animal farm in your, in your <laughs> library. <laughs> I was so confused. I said that, so what? <laughs> so, oh, you know, animal farm is about Marxism and all that kind of thing, and it's about the social structure and all that. So I was like, I said, this guy has gone bonkers, la. you know, that... <laughs> Clutching at straws. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I said that, I said that you are, a, you are making yourself a laughing stock because to label us Marxists, I said, you are insulting the Marxists, no? because we don't even know what Marxism is. We never read books on Marxism. How can you label us Marxists, you know? So, and also, they were trying to say that, they want me to say that Solang is a Marxist. And they keep harping on that, say that, oh, you're, you, you guys have a lot of meeting with Solan, and they're like, she's a Marxist, isn't it? So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, it's a laughing stock because we never read this kind of thing and all that. So finally, the agreement that, yes, I have to say that I am Marxist in kind because after the toing and froing, in my mind, I know that, okay, they have a story already. They have fixed your story. They're not interested in the truth. That's why, so you, you realise that you're very naive because before the arrest, you still have the belief that, uh, okay, we have a system that is, you know, practice of the law, you know, they're all very just, and uh, as you said now, as long as you're above board, no, they won't do this kind of thing. But that, that arrest really shattered the whole thing in my head about the whole Singapore structure that we have, that the abuse can be so blatant. And you know in your head that whatever you say, they are really not interested. You just fit into their story, and the story is that you are Marxist inclined. So I said, okay, if that's what you want to say, I will say it. What else do you want me to say? So I just signed. They just they wanted the statement that I'm Marxist inclined. And that was like the, the straw that broke the camera. I said, okay, you can sleep now. Yeah. Mm. So that, that was a statement. Then after I said that, yes, I agree that to say that, okay, you can go and sleep. Mm. So that, that was the thing.
you would suddenly be woken up by uh, rumbling noises coming from the walls of the cell. You know? It sounded as though the walls were going to crumple down. When it happened a few times, I thought I might be hallucinating. You know? uh, that maybe because of the lack of sleep, or that I may be dreaming. But it was happening so often that one night I actually refused to sleep after hearing the rumbling sound. True enough, one hour or so after, it happened again. So I looked around and followed where the sound came from and it was from the speaker above the cell. They were using me as a bogeyman. And if we go back to the time context in 1987, it was one year before the general elections. And we must not forget that Lee Kuan Yew plans ahead. He plans ahead not just of the 1988 elections that uh, would eventually usher in Go Chok Tong but to usher in after Go Chok Tong, his son. That was very clear to me as the game plan. And in fact, uh, in uh, one of the documents that they seized, and that was my letter to Chia Bun Tai. In that letter, I did analyze that I can foresee Lee Kuan Yew as listing out who are the top 50 people in Singapore who could pose eventually a challenge to his son. And if you look at Singapore, at that time, the opposition was a one-man show. It was poor J.B. Jaratnam working tirelessly on his own, facing the barrages of attack against him. There's not much he can do as an individual. And if you pause, in order to have a political movement, you need people. And who are the people who, in 1987 or by 1988, could have organizational experiences, who have groups of friends together, who have same common vision? Those are precisely the 22 and the friends around them, and the NGOs. So the impact of 87 or the intended consequence was to cut off one whole generation. And it's only after 20 years of 87 that some of those people who are in to, today in NGOs did admit that yes, after 87 there was a lull. Everyone was frightened. Nobody wants to speak. Nobody dares to put their head above the parapet. And that uh, is the political context that we have to understand. And in order to cut off this whole generation, they must give them a name to justify the use of ISA. And the only name they could use, which they could sell to a very gullible population, is to use the name communism. And that's why people like Vincent were forced in to make confessions. Do you prefer to be called a communist, CPM sympathizer, or a Marxist. Marxist sounds a bit like Marx and Spencer's, sounds a bit more <laughs> acceptable. And uh, yeah, that, that is the, the lie.
I think I should leave uh, the Archbishop to put it in his own words, I mean, his feeling in his own words, as to the result of the discussions. It was very good of the Prime Minister to call us up for a dialogue. And this is the conclusion we have arrived at the end of the meeting. We are satisfied that the government of Singapore has nothing against the Catholic Church when it detained 10 of our church workers amongst the 16 who were arrested for possible involvement in the clandestine communist network. Now that you've uh, read statements from the ministry and uh, met officials from the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, uh, <clears throat> what was it that convinced you? After going through the depositions made by the person concerned himself, I have no way of disproving his statement. I have no way. That the man himself admitted that he was using the church. Having accepted Vincent Cheng's involvement in a clandestine communist network, the Archbishop asked the government to give as much evidence on the other four church workers who were detained with Cheng. The Prime Minister then clarified the government's position on this matter. He said it is not the practice, nor would subversives be allowed to get away, by insisting that the government has got to prove everything against them in a court of law, or evidence that will stand up to the strict rules of evidence of a court of law. Mr. Lee said so long as the government knows it's true, so long as there's been no torture, no coercion, no distortion of the truth, that they are satisfied, that they're prepared to act. But they will not act on concocted evidence. After 10 days of interrogation, uh, the director of operations uh, came up to me and said, uh, uh, Vincent, appear on television you know, with your confessions. So when I heard that, I said, no. No, no, I'm not going to do it. So he said, no, do it, Vincent. You know? It is the key to the door. It means that it's the key to your release. Um, so I was saying, no, no, I, I don't want to do it. So he said, ah, I think you are uh, thinking about past confessions of former ISD detainees, no? uh, where they have to appear on television and they, their heads bow, you know. They confess all their wrongdoings and then they glorify Lee Kuan Yew and all that. No, 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 no. Uh, we don't want that. Hmm? So I asked him, so, so what, what do you want? You know? So he said, I want an education for the people of Singapore. Oh, that I thought sounded so nice. Hmm? Yeah, but what does that mean? So he said, you will be uh, um, asked to. Uh, you you will be uh, you will be before a panel of uh, interviewers. Now they ask you questions. You answer. So in my mind, I thought, wow, that would be good, you no? Know, because it's going to be a live show, you no? Know? So they ask questions. I answer voluntarily in it. So that actually would be a way for me to tell the truth. So I said, if that is so, then I would agree. Nah. So he was very happy. The next day, my case officer came up to me and said, let's prepare all these questions. You know? Take a look. Wow. It was about, I think, uh, 30 to 40 questions that they wrote, that was written out, uh, that could actually be asked of me, actually, during the, 
the interview. No? And he told me, let's prepare the questions, which means that let's prepare the answers to the questions. And that's what actually he did. He, did. he um, took the major questions and then he would ask me first, okay, uh, just imagine that I am the panel, no? okay? I ask this question, how will you answer? So I would answer uh, truthfully, you know? And then he said, hey, no, 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 no. You have already confessed, you no? Know? Then I realized, oh gosh, that means I have again to self-incriminate, you no? Know? I have again to, uh, to uh, rehearse the questions according to what the ISD wanted. And that's what he did. So he asked, uh, so we will go through the questions and then he will make sure that uh, in this question there are, for example, maybe three points, okay? Then he will tell me, okay, uh, let's go over it again. He will ask a question and say, okay, now reply. So I have to memorize these three points that we have already discussed and that I have to actually uh, say regarding that particular question. Then he will make sure that uh, I memorize it well. So after finishing several major questions, uh, he told me, okay, let's role play now, you know, uh, you know do the whole thing like as though it is in the real show. The one particular answer that I must, I almost learned it by heart no, at that time, was uh, these words that uh, I uh, was um, intent of organizing peaceful protests. Peaceful protests first, you know, which could lead further to more violent protests. Confrontation no, with the government. Even leading to uh, mass demonstrations, uh, strikes, you know. And ending up actually with public disorder and maybe even rioting and bloodshed. So these, these whole uh, few sentences I had to learn by heart and they make sure that I really repeated it. The recent uh, government expose of the uh, Marxist plot uh, is a timely reminder that uh, there are pockets of dogmatic, tyrannical minorities who are bent on imposing their suicidal ideologies on Singaporeans. The use of the Catholic Church as a camouflage is a new dimension. This is evidently inspired by a mixed bag of uh, liberation theologies and uh, other ideological relics. Nonetheless, in our workshop discussions, uh, this aspect of uh, vulnerability was hotly debated and uh, here I will just make two observations. One, cynicism seems to uh, grease the government's clampdown of the Marxist plot. One typical comment was this, here we go again, the government is invoking the communist bogey to snuff out political dissent. What has happened to all the talk about open government and open debates? The other observation is that the PAP's formula of uh, putting economics first and politics second seems to cut snow ice with the younger Singaporeans. Is this an early sign of a breakdown of our national consensus which has served Singapore for such a long time? Well, first of all, people look at the discussions 
the reports which have been put out, and they ask, is this a Marxist plot? Is it really frightening? I don't know whether you held your discussions before or after the program on Tuesday when Vincent Cheng was interviewed on television. Just, uh, just before. Just before. Yeah. So your participants would not have had the benefit of watching right. at yeah. first hand right. the mastermind of the plot presenting his thinking and his ulterior motives. I watched it. I think a lot of you would have watched it also. A meek, mild, very gentle presentation, I think. Some of you were telling me just now that you were almost persuaded to feel sorry for him. <laughs> <clears throat> and he used such gentle words. It sounded extremely reasonable. Classless society. What's that? In fact, there was a comment uh, in our subsequent discussions that uh, what uh, he meant by classless society effectively meant in typical uh, communist jargon that uh, you mean the overthrow of a democratically elected government uh, and the overthrow of a property-owning democracy like ours with, with a possibly a far more totalitarian government uh, answerable to nobody and accountable to no one. 